So I won't say much. I already said that I won't say much. I'll just say hi and really happy to be here and much more happy than me being here. Everybody will be Jeff K. Judge here. Um, so she's a law professor at Columbia University and she's written this great book. So I know Kate because um, of her work in financial regulation, um, which is sort of what this house is doing anyway. And um, so for me, it was a big surprise to read her book. And um, it's, it's, it's really different than the general or typical financial regulation book um, that you would expect. And I like it a lot. So I'm really looking forward to your talk. And I'm also really looking forward to what our commenters will have uh, to say about it. So um, Christoph Figuleit is one of my old time friends from uh, Munich. And so I can't wait to hear him. <laughs> he's pretty critical usually. <laughs> so we'll, see. <laughs> we'll see what he has to say <laughs> about Kate's book. And then Mark is also a good friend from Heidelberg, um, who is not only a normal law professor, but also a uh, vice president and a really important guy. Um, and, and working on, um, on, on, on something sort of related, um, so we will see. And a band, of course, everybody here knows, um, who is uh, the economist uh, at home, <laughs> at home here, at home uh, around. And here I'm even more interested because I don't know what you're going to talk about. And uh, because given that you're not a lawyer, we will see. So, okay, just we'll start. All right. Thank you so much, Katia, for having me here. Um, it is always a pleasure to be able to be here. Uh, and I really want to thank all three commenters as well. Uh, I know that this is a very unusual book to engage with. Uh, uh, you already mentioned. I mean, this was a huge stretch out of my comfort zone, uh, and I think it definitely grows out of my work, but but really expands and it also explores a variety of issues that I'm still trying to explore. So while in some ways there's a book that's been produced here, the book is really one step of a, an ongoing journey, and I'm really looking forward to being able to discuss it. Uh, again, because it's a whole book, I'm not going to try to summarize a book in the context of a 20 minute talk. But what I do want to do is introduce a little bit of how I came to these themes and, and what I'm talking about when I talk about the middleman economy. The other thing I should acknowledge is I'll probably be talking about this a little bit from an American perspective. Uh, that's how I experience these dynamics. I don't think it is a US specific story, but these dynamics I think are probably particularly pronounced and come into play in a particular way in the United States. And so along with the, the joy of being able to hopefully have a multidisciplinary conversation uh, following the talk, it would also be interesting to think a little bit in comparative terms of what's similar and what's different. All right, so uh, as was mentioned, most of my work is in banking and financial regulation. That's really where I spend almost all of my time. And anybody who studies financial regulation from the United States perspective knows that we really had two intertwined phenomena starting around 1980. On one hand, traditionally the United States uh, had a lot of small community-based banks and thrifts, and they really engaged in relationship-based transactions. So they take money from local depositor, cycle it back into the local communities, and then use a lot of the soft information they had from those relationships to figure out who they're gonna lend money to and when they ought to modify those loans. We then saw a dramatic decrease in the number of those institutions, partly because they were being bought up and consolidated into much larger institutions. So we saw a dramatic growth in the size of the largest banking organizations. So now we're in a situation where the top six organizations control a very significant swaths of the bank assets, which was not unusual in other states, but was very unusual in the United States. And along with that shift, uh, we ended up having a meaningful shift and how they engaged in banking activities. So they brought incredible resources to the table, they brought incredible technology to the table, they had data that they brought to the table. So they really standardized the process of things like loan underwriting. And in the process of standardization, part of what they did was to be able to treat loans as effectively something that could be commodified and then introduced into much longer securitization chains or capital supply chains. So what we saw here is we had the traditional banks up at the top, but then we had what is often has referred to as shadow banking or market-based intermediation. You had the same liquidity transformation uh, that was occurring, but through a much longer and, and more complex chain. Uh, and here you see again that these individual home loans remain in some ways idiosyncratic, but we're assuming that, that we can use all this great technology and data to take soft information and make it hard. You're contracting around what you think matters, and as a result, you're able to engage in a specialization. So we still have the banks that are good at 
originating loans, originating those loans, but maybe we can have other parties that are better at holding the risks associated with those loans, uh, holding, holding those risks. So we have mortgage-backed securities, we have CDOs, and a, and a much longer and more complex system. And in the short run, it appeared to create a lot of gains and a lot of efficiency. It did allow uh, overall U.S. housing home ownership rates to go to the highest level ever in 2006 and 2007. Traditionally, we've had a huge racial housing disparity that's contributed to our racial wealth disparity that went down during this period of time. So it seemed like there were a lot of great efficiency gains. And this was also part of a more global system. You had German banks that were helping to provide capital for a lot of these U.S. home loans in ways that they could not have done in the traditional relationship based system. But then I started to look beyond finance, and part of what I was struck by is these intertwined phenomena of much larger intermediaries creating demand for scale and also having enough power to be able to change the regulatory rules in ways that contributed to much longer and more complex supply chains was not a finance specific phenomenon, but actually was occurring in a lot of different areas in our economy. So you turn to food. We have incredible concentration. I happen to focus here on meat and poultry. It's not specific to meat or poultry. These are incredibly large companies. Look at a company like Cargill. It's actually the largest private company in the United States. At one point, the Cargill family had 14 billionaires, more than any other firm anywhere in the world. They're down to 12. So we still have I mean, five of them on the Bloomberg list of 500 richest people in the world. So these are incredibly large, incredibly influential intermediaries. But of course, they're just one pod in a much longer chain, and they're transforming that overall chain. So similar to what we saw in finance, uh, we see this, this specialization, it was just saying almost a paper specialization, where the scale of the intermediary justifies the disaggregation in production with every little step just doing what it can do most cheaply. And so here, for example, you're seeing shifts in the, the, number, the amount of meat being consumed by China's consumers. Uh, uh, Chinese as they, as they get wealthier really have global effects because of these complex chains. And part of what we're seeing here is you're seeing a lot of maize and soy that's being grown in the United States to help feed all those animals in China. Well, a lot of that maize and soy actually happens to be grown on one of our family farms. And so this is a, again, I, I grew up uh, in the Midwest. And this is a farm that is still our family. This is my cousin Laura, who's a farmer. And so this has been in our family for generations. And part of what's striking is even though she's still farming the same family farm, she has had to massively expand the amount of land that she farms. She's able to do so through just herself and one other person, because she also has this really great uh, uh, combine and other uh, high-tech trackers. But of course, she also has taken on a significant amount of debt to be able to get the amount of land that she needs and the, the equipment that she needs in order to be part of this globalized system. And she really believes in taking care of her land, but partly because she's part of a globalized system, she is a price taker. She's creating what is a commoditized good, so she's eating the additional cost whenever she's making decisions that are more respectful or responsive to the land. So beyond food, retail, this is the area we see a lot in the United States. So the Walmart has been the biggest revenue producer in the United States for the better part of actually the last 20 years. It's also been the biggest employer. Number two, both in terms of revenue production and in terms of employment, is Amazon and growing quite quickly. And again, part of what we're seeing is in the growing scale of these large intermediaries, a chain in how goods are made. So one of the stories I tell is a story of Churchill Weavers. It was based in Perea, Kentucky, originally. Kentucky is the head of one of the borderline southern states. So Kentucky and Georgia had a lot of textile manufacturing, a little bit of it was more. And it's probably because they were very close to the cotton growers in the south. So it was created, it would buy cotton mills locally, transform it into textiles. It really kind of should develop a reputation for producing high quality textiles. It was about bought out by Crown Crafts, which was a Georgia-based textile manufacturer uh, that similarly had big, big operations in Georgia. And, and up until about 2000, they employed well over 2,000 people actually in the production of creating uh, a lot of kids' bedding and then increasingly array of other types of kids' products. Uh, today, they've continued to grow massively in terms of contracts, which is acquired and then killed, killed off with Churchill Weavers. 
has grown massively in terms of the volume of those that adults. It's so still six baby bits for every baby born in the United States. Uh, if you go to the Walmart website, if you're American, staff is rated good, and all kinds of children in kids' bedding. Uh, so incredible volume. The sales have gone up dramatically. The biggest customer is Walmart. Number two is Amazon. Uh, but they now employ 130 people. And that's because even though we might consider them a manufacturer and how we're coding them, as a practical matter, what they do is they have an office in Bentonville where they sell to everybody at Walmart. They have a big warehouse in California. They have a small office in Shanghai. And really, they do some design work and then outsource all the production to factories they don't own or control in China. So what we're seeing here is really a transformation in how goods are made. And so if you want to look kind of at the cotton that's going into these, uh, it doesn't look all that different with what we saw with securitization, where you have a multi-stage process, you have mixing and just aggregating at each little node along the way, creating additional complexities uh, in the overall system, and really moving on a, on a global system. So, so one of the issues the United States was, uh, and in ways that we can kind of come back to later on, concerned about the use of forced labor, uh, leader labor in particular uh, in the United States. Um, and so they said, look, we're really worried about the cotton goods and textiles that were imported from cotton in the United States, given the fact that we know that there's been a significant pattern of forced labor there. But guess what? And the industry says, look, if you're worried about cotton that originally comes from China making its way to the United States, you have to worry not only about the cotton that's coming directly from China, but cotton that's coming from and textiles that come from every single one of these jurisdictions. Because every single one of these jurisdictions that is currently importing to the United States is importing to some degree uh, cotton that originally came from China and then is going through a multi nodal, multi continent production process where then it's moving through another jurisdiction in the process of ultimately coming to China. So, the overall idea in the book, or one of the core ideas, is that we have these, these two trends that are really feeding off of each other. One, we have these increasingly large, increasingly powerful intermediaries. And two, we have these increasingly long, increasingly complex supply chains. And there's been a lot of attention in the United States upon increasing corporate power. I talked a little bit about the book over the particular reasons we might want to pay attention to and be mindful of the type of power that intermediaries exercise that arises from the role that they're playing connecting. But the bigger contribution, I think, is looking, and then more recently, there's been more attention to supply chains. There actually hadn't been that much when I wrote the book, but there's been more attention because of the, the post-pandemic uh, recovery, really creating strains on these chains. But I think the interconnection and the way these two feed off of each other hasn't gotten much attention. So I want to move forward. But the key thing to note is part of it is efficiency-based, and part of it is really just the incredible scale of the intermediary justifying the cost of this aggregation for the office supply chain. And part of it is through the influence they have over the export process. If you look at a company like Cargill, it has a beautiful website, fedbytrade.com, all about how Americans are so fortunate to be able to have the food that we do at the low prices we do because of free trade. So the policies that help to lead to these increasingly long and global supply chains were not independent of the increasing influence of the intermediaries. We can go back to banking. We see something very similar. There's a lot of efforts to like play them down on predatory loans, and the large banks play a very significant role pushing back on a lot of those efforts and those concerns. So there's both regulatory mechanisms and scale and efficiency-based mechanisms to which these two, two really contributed to each other over time. Okay, so I don't want to spend too much time longer, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about the implications. So one, um, is I want to focus more, because there's been more public attention on the whole about corporate power, I want to talk a little bit more about the complex supply chains. So generally speaking, we think about information uh, and, and under a high idea, you know, like one of the joys of the led market that produces a lot of information. Part of what happens if you look closely at these long supply chains is we see they're actually creating new informational demands and then making it actually hard to satisfy those demands. So you're actually introducing information gaps into the system. And so going back to finance, this is where I started off. One of the things that's striking is that now when we think about the 08 financial crisis, a lot of people think about the Lehman Brothers weekend and the bailout of AIG, all of which happened in September 2008. But the crisis really started at the latest in August 2007. 
And if you go back to the transcripts of Federal Reserve policymakers, even in 2007, what they see is like, oh, Rick Michigan uh, saying, look, there's a significant probability not only of a recession, but of a vicious downward cycle where a contraction of the health of the financial system causes a contraction of the health of the real economy, further contracting the health of the financial system in ways that do serious damage to the real economy. This was 07, he recognizes this. And then his colleague, Randy <clears throat> Kersner, was observing, well, part of the challenge is financial regulation, that's what we do. You know how you deal with this. What you do is you figure out where are the holes in the system and where are the interconnections, and you plug the holes and you figure out what are the mechanisms through which you can stop the transmission of the risk to other parts of the system. We know how to deal with the type of risk that they were recognizing. The challenge was that it originates to distribute, risks have become so dispersed that not only did market participants not know where they were, which made them less willing to work with one another, exacerbating the market dysfunction, but policymakers didn't know where they were and they couldn't figure it out. So they spent more than a year trying to play catch up and failing to catch up such that when we even failed, even though the losses by major bank actually weren't that significant, other banks didn't know that, and policymakers couldn't provide the necessary reassurances, dramatically increasing the, the size of the overall crisis. And on a much smaller scale, I think we saw similar challenges uh, in some ways in the supply chain issues that arose post pandemic. So, very early on, it was clear that there was some supply chain friction, but the Federal Reserve, and I would actually say other central banks as well, said, well, these are temporary frictions, they're going to resolve themselves. And if you're a central banker, you don't want to overly respond to signals of disruptions you think are going to self-correct, because then you're going to tighten too much, it's going to end up really hurting employment and harming the economy unnecessarily. So they said, we see inflation going up, but we think it's going to self-correct, so we're not going to respond in a very quick or aggressive manner. Instead, we're going to kind of sit on our hands for a little bit and kind of slowly wind down our asset purchases. But of course, now we know that those signals were very meaningful. And one of the core challenges when you dig into what was happening in supply chain dynamics is very similar to securitization, where everybody was operating with a little piece of the information they needed because it got more complex over time. And once we had a shock to the system, we suddenly needed to have much more information about the upstream risk you're exposed. You couldn't readily get that information. And so everybody was sending out false signals and a coordination game that you needed to be able to go over and help up actually wasn't able to happen to incent the dysfunction to get more dysfunction before you managed to get some of the, the resolution in ways that exacerbated the problem. And again, once again, policymakers were behind. All right, kind of last, last reason to be concerned about the information gaps, I've been talking thus far about how they can introduce new sources of fragility. The other key thing to keep in mind about the structure of this nomad economy is it really was built up at a time where we were focused primarily on efficiency. We assume that consumers wanted the lowest price for all these initiatives that they were generating. Investors wanted to maximize those risk adjusted returns. And so it was really good at producing those things. And there was some very real benefits. In the United States, you have incredible choice, incredible convenience, very low prices, I'd say artificially too low prices. Uh, but guess what? Now in Europe and the United States, there's a lot of investors who are instead saying, no, actually, I care more about the risk adjusted returns. There's some of these ESG considerations, their environmental impact and other impact on sustainability considerations I care a lot about. You have trillions of dollars flowing through intermediaries that are making claims about the sustainability of the impact. And then we have actually a bunch of research suggesting a lot of those claims are spurious at best, certainly not all of them, but a lot of them. And one of the core challenges is companies really don't have the information that they need. In the United States, there's a big fight right now over whether or not companies should have to make disclosures regarding not only their carbon footprint, but the carbon footprint of the upstream suppliers. If you care about ESG, you want that information because you want to know what is the overall impact and you don't want to engage in gamesmanship to say, oh, I don't have that impact because I like to ship it off to another corporation. But if you don't, but right now they really don't have that. And part of the challenge is they can't quickly transition to it. Another challenge going back is, is on labor. There are a lot of concerns right now with labor. I talked earlier, for example, about the, the concerns with major labor. And again, China is not alone. Seven of the top 10 cotton exporters uh, actually do use forced labor in the supply chain. China labor is often more common than you would think. Well, guess what? You have a bunch of different companies making all kinds of claims regarding human rights, labor practices, environmental impact, 
not for themselves, but for this supply chain, because that's what the consumers care about. They probably care about it for organic and special labels, but a broader set of consumers, so these are things we really care about. But then very often, you actually go in and you do a deep dive, you see all the companies that are making these really great claims are also actually buying their supply chains in ways that they might actually not have been aware of, uh, supporting a lot of the exploitative practices that they're expressly disavowing through their claims. So the core idea is that there were a lot gained through the rise of large intermediaries along supply chains, but there are also a lot of information gaps that are proving very costly particularly as we bring a broader set of values to the table as consumers and as investors. So this is part of the challenge we're facing. All right, so now I'm gonna be really quick on the solution uh, and it's not a solution, but it's more like a, a fee for how we might think about this. Uh, can we do better? I certainly like to think so. The title of the book was not The Middleman Economy and All the Reasons is Horrible and Dangerous. It was direct, it's a much more hopeful tone. Um, and the idea here is not that direct exchange is going to be a solution to all of our problems, but that a modest amount of direct exchange actually is needed to build the political will to bring about the structural solutions that you need when you're facing structural problems. Because one of the challenges we now have is this has left us fundamentally disconnected from the people and the places that are helping to feed us and to put us. And so we're often have stopped thinking about how much impact our actions have, even though they really do, in our daily lives. So I spent a little time, because I talked about farms earlier, uh, CFAs on these small farms who kind of pay for share, you show up, you have to get your vegetables, they're incredibly inconvenient, but they're also growing in popularity. So part of the are things people are already actively opting out of the convenient choice that they get for some of these alternatives. This happens to be the CSA that I'm a member of, that's my daughter, one of their little activities, um, and, and the vegetables are delicious, even though it's incredibly inconvenient to get to. And what we see here is not only do you have a much richer set of information, because you're seeing where it comes from, and you know the farmer, they are organic, but they don't need to get an organic label, so they don't need a third party providing the verification, I can see it all for myself. Uh, but you also have a richer set of dynamics and relationships that can come into play in ways that, that can be really valuable, particularly in this in this moment. And a lot of, of softer shifts in the direction of relatively shorter, relatively more accountable supply chains can also be very helpful. And so again, banking is where I spend all my time. In the United States, actually an absurd number of people finance their cars and have realized it um, before I started doing a lot of research. Um, and you really have two options. One, you can go to a bank or other financial institutions directly and say, do you loan me money so I can go buy a car? The other, you can wait till you're at the car dealer, and then you can ask the car dealer to work with another financial intermediary to be able to get you the loan. Neither of these are kind of like true direct, like you go to the farm, but one involves one intermediary, and the other involves two intermediaries. 80% of people use the two intermediary approach, and guess what? The two intermediary approach is significantly more costly on average. So people are spending much more on makeup statements than they need to because of that extra layer. And because of the implicit and explicit biases that shape a lot of transactions in the United States, there's also a lot of research that not only is it more expensive, but that borrowers of color are paying significantly more than even white borrowers once you go into the two intermediary scene. So the idea here is this rebalancing towards this more long and complex and have some, some real tangible benefits. So then there's basically five ideas, uh, partly these kind of ways that you might think about individual decisions, but it is also thinking about where we need potential innovation, where innovation can potentially create value, and then thinking also the policy making matter, given that there are these overall trends in place and there's some real benefits, how do we start to create more of a balance uh, so it doesn't get too out of whack? All right, so I look forward to the commentary. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Christoph Egoleit from the University of Munich. First of all, I would like to give my, my thanks to uh, Katja, who invited me to this uh, wonderful event to ask me to read this very interesting book. And that's the second thanks. Thanks very much to you, uh, Catherine, for writing this very interesting book, for uh, turning our attention to the issues of uh, supply chains. and. Uh, I would like to comment in various uh, ways on that book. Definitely, you uh, have a good point 
in uh, raising the issues of the supply chain, uh, chain, uh, chain. And definitely you have a good point in uh, formulating critique on a lot of, uh, on many features of the supply chain. Um, what I would like to focus on in my comments is to, uh, to give the critique, to give the discussion, to give the issues of um, the supply chain a little bit more specification. And I'll start with one quote of your book at, at the end, which I think is very, very telling. The middleman economy cannot be blamed, blamed for all of the ills facing society but it contributes to many of them. That's definitely true, but um, the issue is uh, what specifically does the middleman economy contribute to? to? What is uh, the specific harm that we can blame the middleman economy for? Because on the other side of that, that's something that is very beautifully laid out in the book. It's obvious that the middleman, middleman economy it can certainly be blamed for many, many very useful features that we uh, that we enjoy all the time. I have to confess that I love Amazon. I love to shop <laughs> at Amazon. I love uh, many, many other platforms. I love to uh, to uh, eat vegetables from all over the world. Uh, therefore, I have to confess again, I enjoy uh, the middleman economy in many features. I enjoy low prices. <laughs> uh, at the time of inflation, uh, you know what I mean. Uh, and therefore, the crucial question is, when does the enabling factor that the middleman um, structure uh, comes with, when does it turn into a social harm uh, factor? Also, very interestingly, something that I uh, would like to uh, discuss in more detail. What is the balance between some of the harm uh, factors and the enabling benefits? Of course, we have harm factors and we have, we have uh, enabling benefits, efficiency benefits, and of course, we have to somehow strike a, a balance. And that is something that we could discuss in a little bit more uh, detail. Another very um, important point for the discussion will be as we live and are used to a middleman society, we definitely know of the harms that are created by the middleman, by the indirect economy. What we've pretty much forgotten about may be the harms of the direct economy. And I think we should shed a little, shed a little bit more light on these harms too. Of course, I cannot deal with all these questions in detail. So I uh, have tried to, to figure out some uh, aspects of specification that I would like to bring into the discussion. The first one is when we talk about middlemen, we have this idea of the supply chain, but maybe we think of different phenomena when we when we use the uh, the term middleman, the proxy middleman, maybe a proxy for uh, certain features. I will discuss that. Then I will try to discuss what are the relevant issues. Not everything that we may blame the supply chain for is an issue. And of course, I will discuss briefly on the cures. What are the tools to deal with issues uh, created uh, by the middleman society? There may be legal cures, of course, and I'm a lawyer, therefore I think in legal terms, we'll have the econo economist's perspective later. But also there are non-legal cures. If I see your children playing uh, on, the, uh, on the farmer's market or whatever that was, I think that's a very nice picture, a very nice lifestyle. But obviously, we will not produce lifestyles by tools of law. Therefore, we have to look for this distinction, too. If there are issues, are these issues that are more or less a promotion of lifestyles or something that we need uh, hard uh, legal tools to deal with them? Now, first on the phenomena, uh, of course, and that's probably something that a, a lawyer shouldn't talk to about uh, for too long because we have an economist here 
you are writing on economies of scale and on their beauties. Uh, the big retailers have improved uh, efficiency and consumer satisfaction greatly. That's obvious. The same applies to the real estate market. There, we have many aspects of uh, improvement of efficiency on the one side. On the other side, we have these weird organizational effects that are relevant in the American market, the different, different aspects. But in, in general, we have uh, the, the, uh, the efficiency improvement aspect here uh, as well. We have investment tools that you've pointed out uh, that have... Um, change and basically change in the direction of more efficiency and we have the aspect of specialization that we are dealing with in all modern societies all the time um, it's obvious that these uh, aspects occur then we have another feature and a feature that uh, is uh, brought in by digitalization that's the enormous amount of data that can be processed and uh, be accessed at any point of time, big data and big link. Uh, these are factors that should not uh, easily be confused with uh, the, uh, the uh, supply chain uh, issues. It's just uh, an issue on its own and we should try to, we discuss issues, we should try to separate uh, questions that relate basically to a, a, a blockchain, uh, to, to a supply chain phenomenon without digitalization, we should uh, separate these issues from specifically, specifically uh, from issues specifically derived uh, or, or um, attributed to uh, digitalization. Also, we have issues of globalization, which, which can easily be and should be distinguished uh, from supply chain issues, you can come up with a very nice, long and complicated supply chain while staying within the United States. What you've uh, pointed out, out on the Walmart uh, phenomenon was uh, firstly a, a, a middleman uh, creation that was uh, focused on the United States and, uh, state and later became a globalization issue. We have very specific issues here. We of course, talk about prices, make use of the worldwide production conditions, whatever they are, low wages, low environment uh, standards. Um, and uh, this phenomenon, I would suppose, is a phenomenon uh, of its own uh, that could be separately uh, addressed. So if we have some, some subtopics here to talk about, the issue is what's the specificity of uh, the middleman, as I already mentioned, may not be a proxy for size issues, economies of scale uh, issues, may it not be a proxy for globalization issues, then uh, we should, may, may talk a bit more about globalization. H how clearly can we define digitaliz digitalization uh, issues uh, in the middleman uh, questions? Also, very frequently in the book, are we talking about health demands on products that can be defined as certain uh, product uh, requirements? Are we talking about certain conditions of production that are somehow be uh, created or, um, or uh, be, be, that are somehow part of the supply chain? The, general question in whether or not these subtopics are specifically related to the middleman uh, criterion is would there be another is another issue if the uh, the services or the actions that we are uh, talking to would occur within a integrated uh, corporation now, would it be any different if walmart would uh, uh, employ uh, certain sub corporations or, or agents uh, all over the world and not use a separate corporations. So we, as we all know, as corporate lawyers, uh, you, you can always uh, exchange the structure, the legal structure of the supply chain by integrating 
uh, into uh, corporations and uh, groups. So this is, as, as far as the phenomena are, are concerned, the, the very important demand. Let's specify what uh, we discuss when we refer to middlemen. Let's not obscure different issues by referring to this broad, uh, to this broad uh, um, uh, criterion, even though, of course, it's quite you know tangible and, and it's it's obvious in modern times that we have issues here. We can become more specific. So very much the same refers uh, or relates to the the issues. When we go through your book, you're telling stories that are mainly stories about power abuse for. For, for different uh, reasons. That's pretty much the overall issue. And it's pretty clear that these uh, forms of power abuses occur and it's important that you uh, state them. They should be addressed according to the specific misconduct. And I would suppose that the interesting and catchy term middleman may somehow obscure this specific misconduct because the misconduct that we're talking about is so different all over the, the different um, uh, phenomena and issues that are uh, discussed in the book. One, one major relevant aspect of power abuse is creaming off excessive profits. It's obvious that this to a certain extent occurs uh, you, your your uh, almost favorite example of the real estate agents uh, who, by their fee structure and their organizational structure, manage to keep up uh, excessive profits is a very good example. And wherever such practices occur, they should be addressed. In particular, and here again. Um, the, the features that may describe the issue with a little bit more specification if there's in transparency involved in the fee structure or if there's a market failure, as it is probably the case within the real estate ca uh, cases in, in Germany, we have some similarities, but some differences too with, with regard to real estate agents. So it's not easily compare. We, we don't have these traditional organizational factors that impede competition. Therefore, it's difficult to discuss that. Seducing customers is another issue of the supply chain, but of course, ba basically on an issue of, of uh, uh, abuse of power, also an issue of uh, using intelligent algorithms in order to, uh, to seducing customers to certain uh, conduct. And of course, these uh, uh, potential uh, forms of abuses have to be uh, addressed. However, there should be a significant threshold, uh, not any kind of uh, overconsumption and uh, unbeneficial uh, sale or, or a conduct by customers is uh, uh, is based upon uh, relevant uh, seduction. We need to specify that a bit more. Uh, I, I don't have the time to do that here. Of course, the abuse of data and algorithmic power, if it's not used for seduction, but for, uh, for other uh, tricks and abuses has to be addressed, but then it's, you know, we should address the abuse of uh, data the same relates to intransparency. The supply chain creates intransparency, as you have uh, nicely uh, pointed out, particularly uh, the, the example of the financial crisis is a very, very important example of uh, intransparency. And uh, it shows the need for uh, addressing this intransparency in, in according to the specific uh, character. Overconsumption and health problems, waste, uh, is uh, also an issue of the supply chain uh, chain that you have uh, pointed out. However, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, skeptical on whether we get more uh, than the, the statement that we do have something like overconsumption, health problems and uh, waste. I think we have turned that issue to education and the social system in general. I return to that issue later. 
Um, safety issues as far as products are concerned, there's a good example on the E. coli bacteria because that's an example from Germany and we uh, remember that case uh, very well. Um, you're pointing out how difficult it is to find out where the issue of uh, uh, bacterial uh, um, pollution within food within certain vegetables, how, how difficult it is it was to, to, to be traced back uh, and to resolve the issue. Um, however, I mean, here in Germany, we can say this does not happen very frequently. You know, we, we had a virus problem recently and uh, we very rarely have bacteria uh, problems. Actually, I'm really astounded that among all these vegetables that we buy from all over the world, very little, very, very little happens. To me, nothing ever happened during all my life. I wasn't one of these uh, 100 people with the E. coli bacteria. So it's a nice example, but it's not representative uh, at all. Also, here we, we have a, a good ex example for the need to compare. If we are in a direct economy and if we have all these little farmers who sell, they may have more problems on, on the hygiene uh, aspect than huge chains, uh, huge uh, supermarkets who risk a lot by huge uh, defects and who can invest a lot in, uh, in hygiene. So uh, it's not uh, really clear whether this is a, a relevant issue. Um, uh, abusing market conditions in developing countries is definitely a relevant issue. The question here is, is just how can we impose our standards and laws on the production conditions in other countries? Something I don't want to get into too much here, or cannot get into too much here. Just would like to share the remark that we should avoid paternalistic colonialism in that we should not impose all the standards that we have uh, to developing uh, countries. Uh, contributing to social inequality and discrimination is something that uh, um, showed up in your uh, brief presentation and uh, that's definitely a, a problem in our society. But again, is it a specific middleman uh, uh, issue? I am uncertain. I would suppose that it's not. I would suppose that uh, discrimination is rather a, a social issue. And wherever we see discriminating effects, like you pointed out for the US, as far as certain black and white buyers of cars are concerned, the aspect uh, of uh, being socially disadvantaged may be um, of relevance in that context too, so that the racial discrimination may not be the only factor. However, whether it is or not, I would say it's very difficult to address it through the supply chain. So uh, um, discussing some of the of the policies, I'm, I'm close to the end, don't be afraid that I'm, I'm taking an hour here. Um, I found your policies very interesting and, and some of them are obvious. Of course, it's desirable uh, to uh, get more serious with antitrust law to address the issue of power that has uh, definitely increased uh, within the last years and uh, decades. And that's definitely uh, in the line with the principle of economics for as long as you can define uh, certain uh, um, abuses of power as uh, relevant under the uh, laws of antitrust, which I will not unfold uh, here. Um, of course, it's very important. That's something I, I like very much about the book, um, that you stress the need for free negotiation of prices and, uh, if necessary, for regulating fee fees, not like regulating to, to set certain uh, fixed prices, uh, but for impeding, uh, for impeding uh, inhibitions of free ne ne uh, uh, negotiations. And that's something that is pretty much related to the antitrust aspect, uh, because these um, uh, uh, price uh, uh, negotiation inhibitions will take place, uh, particularly when uh, competition, when uh, the market uh, uh, powers do not work, and that is uh, typically in the 
antitrust uh, situation. Also, uh, it may be very important to enforce the transparency of fees and uh, maybe to enforce some transparency on unequal pricing. We do have some EU, EU uh, legislation uh, on that and uh, may, may be interesting for you to uh, look into that. Um, addressing harmful effects um, of the supply chain, of course, if we can define them, if we can define them with, with specificity, that's definitely something uh, worthwhile. Um, mandatory disclosure is something that is very popular in the United States, probably as well as in, in uh, Germany and Europe. I, I read with interest on the Congo rule example and on your greenwashing experiences. Uh, mandatory disclosure is uh, definitely the most desirable and the uh, finally most finely tuned tool of the law to handle uh, uh, market failures and the abuse of power. However, it's very difficult to design rules accurately and effectively, and you, you have uh, pointed out that very uh, nicely. Of course, it's important to support direct exchange. I, I think I would like to stress all that you've um, wrote on that within your policies three, four, and five. I think they, they shed uh, the, the light on, on uh, the same, in, in, in some aspects on the same direction that uh, direct exchange is supposed to be supported. Infrastructure has to be improved for direct exchange. That's definitely worthwhile. However, what I don't, what does not convince me so much is the focus on social welfare, equality, and reasonable lifestyles, even though I think that's uh, uh, something we could, we should all promote and, and uh, uh, we should all be very serious about. However, I, I don't uh, get the point that these are, uh, that th these are goals that uh, uh, can uh, be uh, pursued by uh, bringing in line the, the supply chain. Um, I would suppose that uh, social equality can be achieved better by uh, certain uh, other social um, means uh, of society, of the law, uh, by the tax system and by social <clears throat> benefits. Maybe in this, the US perspective is a little bit different from the European perspective, where the welfare system is probably still a little bit uh, stronger. And uh, therefore, we would uh, trust more to it and maybe do not think as uh, directly um, uh, of aligning the supply chains when it comes to social security. And uh, if we talk about lifestyles, as I already mentioned, and uh, public awareness, I, I would suppose that's a, an issue of education, something that is worthwhile, but nothing that can be enforced, not by law and not by any other means. So I think the phenomena and issues should be specified and distinguished. I think we need some um, more thorough balancing of social gains and harms. I think the tools, the legal tools and other tools need to be uh, addressed and uh, more finely tuned and adapted to the issues. And we should be probably uh, a, a little bit um, um, uh, careful about uh, achieving social justice by relating to the supply chain. This is pretty much what I would like to say. Many thanks for your attention. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Katja, for inviting uh, us to comment uh, here on this uh, very interesting book. And thank you, uh, Catherine, for offering us this uh, inspiring reading, reading experience. So um, my name, as um, uh, Katja already said, is Mark Weller. And um, I'm from Heidelberg University, from uh, this Institute of Comparative Law in the um, old city of Heidelberg. I would like to make basically four comments. The first one um, concerns the main thesis of the uh, book. Uh, the second one uh, criticizes slightly uh, the signature examples, uh, especially the equally example um, Hans Christoph uh, already mentioned. Um, and uh, the third comment is on the solution you propose, shorter is better, direct is best. Um, I would say there is a necessity of a 
differentiated approach, but also you, you mentioned your book, but um, um, I would like to point out here some examples. And uh, I have a fourth remark. I would like to, um, yeah, to, to bring another argument in favor of your uh, thesis uh, with the argument of climate neutrality, which um, advocates for uh, shortening supply chains. Um, my first comment concerning the your five thesis they are here again. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate you on these five theses. Regardless of what one thinks of their content, one must positively acknowledge that these theses are clear and catchy and one can apply them in everyday life and as a self-test. And you have founded them very well uh, with a coherent argumentation. And I think this clarity of these theses um, is a value in itself. Why? Uh, because I'm coming from an old-fashioned university from Heidelberg, where we had uh, famous philosophers. Here is Georg Friedrich Wilhelm Hegel, um, and also Hans Georg Gadamer uh, taught there. And uh, Hegel shaped the dialectics. And um, um, and according to both, clear theses uh, are the prerequisite and the most important tool for scientific progress. And uh, I think you, with these five theses, you have. Uh, bring forward the discussion on the middleman economy. Um, jurisprudence um, is a textual science, and we don't have uh, an absolute truth. We only have a relative one, and it's only a, an approx approximative, um, um, an approximative science. That means uh, an approximative truth. That means uh, we have to formulate uh, always antithesis uh, against the thesis to find a better solution, a synthesis. Uh, which can then be challenged again as a new thesis. This is an ongoing dialectical progress. And so I would like to um, take the invitation of Katja and uh, uh, formulate a little bit, a little critique to your thesis in order uh, perhaps to have a little differentiated approach. Concerning um, the problems of the middleman economy, uh, which you raised in your book and um, um, and on, in one chapter, you even speak of the dark side of the middleman economy. There are, of course, a lot of um, absolutely uh, correct and uh, uh, true uh, observations, and uh, Hans Christoph mentioned them also already in this aspect. Um, the first problem, or what, one of the problems you mentioned, is the non transparency and the information loss. And you give these signature examples um, with the, the outbreaks one in Colorado and one in Germany. And as uh, Hans Christoph already said, I, I think these examples are, I see your point, but uh, um, they are very rare. And uh, the examples date from 2011 here with the E. coli outbreak. And if you would make the test um, without the uh, middleman economy, would there uh, be or would we have also such outbreaks? And indeed, in Germany, we have even a very famous uh, case from the German Supreme Court. It's uh, on the Salmonella um, after a, a wedding, and it was from a local caterer, so it was a direct economy. And uh, even there, there was a problem to establish causality uh, in, in this aspect. So um, I would say this is a problem, but it can also happen without middlemen. Um, the second aspect you um, mentioned, or, or perhaps another aspect with the digitalization, uh, this, um, this non-transparency can a little bit be balanced. Um, even if with long supply chains, we have um, platforms where you can trace back uh, um, uh, the products, um, uh, the raw materials um, to their source. So I think, um, uh, of course, sometimes there is this intransparency, but you can bridge it a little bit with the new means of digitalization. The second problem you mentioned, and that's absolutely correct, is the vulnerability of long supply chains. Here in Germany, we um, were aware of, of this problem uh, with the outbreak now, with the, um, the COVID uh, outbreak. Um, uh, we had a lot, lot of goods which were stuck in the um, in the shipping supply chain, um, for example, because China, uh, because they were the shutdown in, in China. Um, and the third aspect you criticize is the, is the cost aspect. Um, and that's clear. And in Germany, we have, for example, big middlemen like Aldi and Lidl. And, um, and if you take the milk products, for example, there are, there's only a little 
a benefit uh, coming at the end uh, of the supply chain to the farmers. Uh, they only have little gains uh, in this long supply chain. Um, the problems of the middleman economy on the one hand, on the other hand, we have also advantages, upsides. Um, we have to acknowledge that there is some expertise and you do that in your book. Um, uh, there's expertise vis-a-vis -vis customers, vis-a-vis -vis producers, vis-a-vis -vis transportation. Um, uh, and uh, for example, um, concerning the transportation, if you think of the cereals at the moment, uh, which, we're, which are shipped from Ukraine to other states of the world who uh, are not able to produce uh, enough cereals for their population, here it's absolutely necessary to have experts uh, like uh, specialized middlemen uh, in this transportation field. Um, the second um, uh, advantage is uh, that a middleman can bridge information asymmetries and bring people and products together. You also describe this in your book. Um, and uh, the third effect, the scaling effect, I've already mentioned, um, by having this uh, big number of transactions, you generate efficiency and um, are able to offer lower prices. Dant will certainly uh, speak about that. So what I would um, um, say that um, it's an interesting thesis, shorter is better, direct is best, but I think we have to differentiate a little bit. Um, and um, you are mainly, or one of the, the big issues in your book is to attack the big uh, intermediaries, uh, the misuse of power. And uh, I would also say that um, um, the area of law where you have to handle with, with this misuse of power is uh, antitrust and competition law. Um, specific misconduct um, can be addressed. Um, and uh, that would, it's of course necessary to, to look at this uh, quasi monopoles or oligopoles in, this, um, uh, in these supply chains. The second, um, second solution you propose is to cut out the middlemen or to bypass them. Uh, direct is best is your thesis. Um, and I would say we can observe this in some parts of the digital economy, in the fintech area, your specialty. Um, we have uh, such a bypassing of intermediaries. Um, for example, so some brokers or issuing banks, collective custodians and Clearstream are um, bypassed by uh, the blockchain technology, um, um, by tokens, um, and these, this decentralization um, is, has, of course, a lot of advantages. Uh, it enables direct interactions between the users of blockchain technology um, and uh, blockchain technology aims at eliminating central uh, technical and trust creating intermediaries. So here would be a, a very good example for your uh, thesis. And um, there are advantages also in not only the cost reduction, but also um, the idea of democracy, which is brought forward uh, with blockchain technology that would also go in the direction of your, your book. However, on the other side, um, you must see that uh, these intermediaries, these big intermediaries, have also an important uh, function from a regulatory perspective, from the view of the legislator, and, and Katja is an expert for, um, if you want to regulate the banking sector or the uh, insurance sector, then you need to, uh, to have big players. Otherwise, it's, it's not possible. Or the energy sector. We talked at a lunch about regulating the energy level in households, and it's very difficult to address every single household uh, to regulate the temperature. It's much easier to uh, address only the big suppliers of energy um, for this regulation. So um, if you cut out all those middlemen, you lose some liable parties and information debtors and guarantors in, uh, for regulation that uh, we have to take this in, into consideration. And um, I would say uh, another, a slightly different approach to cut the supply chain or to shorten the supply chain is to regulate it in a certain way. Um, Hans Christoph already um, mentioned also this aspect of regulating uh, the supply chain. And I would just give you an example because it's a typical European approach. Um, 
uh, of the Supply Chain Act, uh, which we have in France and in Germany, and which we are discussing on the European level. You mentioned this uh, directive already. And that would also be perhaps a tool um, to solve a part of the supply chain problem, not all, of course, uh, but uh, one part, and it's uh, especially the part um, which uh, you mentioned, I think, was the misuse of um, um, the misuse or the abusing of market conditions with child labor, which uh, which low um, um, low level of of, um, of labor, and um, the supply chain act, the German one and also the French one, uh, contains duty, so-called duties of care, which are addressed uh, to big businesses, and big businesses have to establish general risk analysis. They have to implement preventive measures. Um, and also to have, take remedial measures in the case something happens. And um, all those measures uh, have, the, have the idea um, to, yeah, to, to give a sort of minimum standard in the supply chain. Um, of course, there is a counter argument, uh, uh, the colonialization argument uh, that uh, Europeans are recolonializing um, um, the global south by, by this uh, regulation. However, uh, we don't want to export our uh, working conditions. It's only a minimum standard, a, a human rights minimum standards, which should be applied. And I think uh, by having this um, compromise which with the minimum standards, it's uh, legitimate to it's uh, legitimate to have this um, to have this um, duty of care. And uh, what is new in this uh, this this German Supply Chain Act is that it uh, doesn't only address uh, the business unit uh, uh, of the reporting company of the company which is uh, situated in Germany or in Europe, but it's also uh, extended to the controlled companies and means to the whole group of companies and also to the suppliers, to the direct one, but in certain way also to the indirect suppliers uh, in the in the chain and. What probably will happen is that uh, the level uh, of the working conditions in these supply chains will a little bit become a little bit become higher um, when there is when this duty of care will be established. So that would be um, another tool um, instead of bypassing the middlemen uh, to regulate them in this way and then to have the hope that um, the conditions in the supply chain. Um, turns out uh, better. And uh, finally, my final comment is um, on an, another argument because you always uh, the, the fifth principle you mentioned is the, the bridging principle you, to have new bridges. And I would like to um, um, to present an uh, argumentative bridge for your thesis, and it's uh, I think uh, climate neutrality. Um, um, you mentioned sustainability in your book, but it's not a central uh, uh, argumentation in your book. Um, and uh, I think with the sustainable development goals, climate action, uh, to take urgent actions to combat climate change and its impacts, uh, that could broadly be um, put, we can bring it forward in, in favor of your argumentation. Um, and especially in, in, in Europe, we have this uh, sustainability due diligence directive. It's on the level of a proposal at the moment. And we have an article, Article 15, concerning um, uh, um, combating climate change. And uh, if it uh, will be voted, this directive, uh, it will, uh, if it be, um, enters in for into force, um, the um, the companies have to adjust their business model uh, to the Paris Agreement with the 1.5 degree um, limit of, um, of global warming, warming, and they have to transform their business uh, into a climate neutral uh, business, uh, and uh, indeed they have to reduce their emission targets. That's a very um, major change in company law, uh, or in regulation in this field. Um, uh, when it will enter in for, into force, uh, probably next uh, year. And um, why is it so relevant for the supply chains? Well, because the, um, the climate neutrality, uh, um, and you mentioned that uh, also uh, in your presentation, uh, Catherine, um, is uh, dependent from the so-called so scope three emissions. And you see them here in blue. Um, we have the green uh, green emissions. That's the business itself, the reporting company with the scope one emissions, and 
attributed to the reporting company are also the uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, upstream and downstream, uh, which are called as a, uh, the scope three emissions in the greenhouse gas protocol. For example, producers in the um, um, value chain upstream, also the uh, transport um, are attributed to reporting company. Uh, the same holds true for the downstream um, um, value chain uh, um, until the consumption of the goods. And of course, if you shorten the supply chain, you uh, shorten also the, um, the level of the emissions. And I think this would be another strong argument for your argumentation. I wonder a little bit, and this, this would be the final aspect um, to conclude with a question to you, why you didn't uh, bring this forward in your book in a, in a more prominent way. You, you mentioned it, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's not a central part of your argumentation. Of course, we heard you are a financial expert uh, at Columbia University, not an environmental lawyer. We are neither. But I think it would be a, a good, um, um, uh, good co-argumentation for your thesis. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to discuss. OK, thank you so much, Katja, for in inviting me. And thank you, Kate, for writing a, a wonderful book. Um, my name is Bernd Skira. I take a bit more, as Katja already mentioned, the uh, view of uh, research and business and uh, economics. And let me start by giving a bit more support for what you outlined, uh, more support for the rise of the middlemen. And I apologize for focusing primarily on the middlemen and not so much on the supply chain. And uh, let me outline to you how we, uh, if I teach, how I try to outline why the middleman is uh, so important. That's a bit strange. Uh, I, ask, I quite frequently ask my students the question, who is the competitor of a hotel such as Hilton? And probably you would think about other hotel brands like Arcor, Hyatt, and so forth. And then I usually ask the question, well, what about a middleman such as Booking.com? If you look at the hotel industry, a lot of booking is done via this booking platform, and they charge what I consider to be quite a significant commission. And, and so if you think about the hotel industry, if we think about competition in an industry such as the hotel industry, I think we need to think about all those platforms such as Booking or Airbnb and others. So this is the first thing I wanted to outline if we do the teaching, how we try to come up with the importance of the middlemen. The second one, I thought I give you an idea about how you could empirically address a topic that's usually quite difficult to address. And it also relates a bit to your other background in, in finance. Uh, what we did in a project is that we wanted to derive who gets the attention in the retail banking industry. And the idea that we pursued was the following. We looked at the organic search results uh, from, from a search engine such as Google. And the organic search result, as you probably know, there are two types of results, the ones that are paid, those are called sponsored search results, and the other one who are organic. And what Google claims, and I think to at least some extent, probably a larger than Google manages to accomplish is to provide the best results for what the consumer is actually searching for. So the idea that we had was the following. We looked at what our consumers are searching for. And for example, if you search for a keyword such as real estate credit, you get uh, different types of uh, results. You get, and we just looked at the organic search results. And of course, the higher you are up on the list, probably the more what we call attention you get. And what we could also do is we could explore that Whenever firms are listed on the same search results, we could say, okay, they might be competitors. So what we can do or what we try to do is we try to describe an industry by all those search phrases. So for example, for the retail banking industry, we had several hundreds of search phrases. We essentially looked for the organic search results. We did a bit of weighting, depending on how many people search for a particular search phrase, whether you got up on the list on the top or more on the bottom. And we tried to derive who gets attention and who's also similar to each other in terms of when you get up here. And then, of course, the idea that we once had was that you can repeat that over time, but that's not too important here. 
Let me present you some of the results. Uh, what you can see here, we can derive different subtopics within the retail banking market. That's not the primary interest. What I wanted to focus on is that we have producers and non-producing firms in the retail banking market. And of course, what we consider to be producers are banks, insurance companies, and non-producers would be a platform in between. For example, in Germany, it would be Check24. So not someone producing the banking product, but something else. And what I would like to highlight here are two results. If we look at the share of, sorry, the share of the producers, simply counting the numbers, we can already see there's roughly one third. It varies a little bit across the segments, but it's just one third in the retail banking sector. And if we weight it by the attention, meaning whether you show up for prominent keywords, whether you show up on top of the list, that attention goes down to only 14%. So if we look at the retail banking market, the, the actual producers, the banks just get, at least in Germany a few years ago, roughly 14%. And of course, that gives a lot of opportunities for others to step in between the banks and the retail customers, and of course, squeezing out some kind of margin. So that would be maybe one also empirical approach to support a bit more some of the claims that you make that we have importances of, of middlemen in between. And uh, to also focus on a different industry is I do a bit of work in the edtech industry. And I mean, the news industry is, is suffering from a problem. We had a digital transformation from selling newspapers, getting lots of subscriptions. And nowadays there are ad-based finances of course, there are some uh, publishers such as the New York Times, they managed to come up with a paid model, but I, I would say most of the publishers are kind of struggling, they, they rely on advertising revenues. If you look at the advertising market, you would feel like we have a publisher, the publisher is the news, is a website selling ad spaces, and we have the advertiser and you would feel, okay, it's very easy, whatever the advertiser is spending, more or less that goes directly to the publisher. And unfortunately, that's not the case. The, the, the market is hugely fragmented. I, I give you here an illustration of who is in between there. I could take half an hour to explain it, but, but to give you an idea, roughly only half of every advertising dollar that is spent by the advertiser gets to the publisher. And that's of course a huge problem for financing the, the news uh, industry. So I think what you do in your book, you raise a very, very, very important uh, problem. Now let me have a look at, let me express two views on, on your book. The one is as, as a private person, I have a lot of sympathy for what you outline. And to just illustrate what I every once in a while try to do as, as a private person, I might use booking to find a hotel. And then I think about, okay, should booking get my money or should I rather go direct to the hotel? Because I feel the hotel is having the work, they have to set up the room, they have to clean it. So I feel they should get my money. So sometimes I search at the platform and then I try to go direct and do the booking with the hotel directly to kind of follow what, what you outlined to make sure the money goes to whatever you might consider to be the right person. That's what I do. And of course, I also use Amazon. I think you mentioned that. And also at Amazon, it's, it's not for free. They, they get quite a significant uh, share of the revenue. And sometimes I try to figure out who's the seller. I also try to go direct and then essentially kind of mistreat Amazon, but, but try to make sure the right person gets the money. Yeah. And also, if you go to a price comparison website in Germany, that would be Idealo or others, the same happens whenever you click, Idealo is making money. So one way to make sure the money goes to the right person is not to click, you just recall the name and then go directly and try to spend the money directly. So that's what I eventually tried to do as a, as a private person. So I have a lot of personal sympathy for what you outlined there. But then, of course, I mean, as a researcher, I'm in business and economics. Yeah, I, I, what I try to do is, as a researcher, <clears throat> I try to, uh, I have to accept the middleman is, there, is, is, is in there. So um, 
And what is important to realize what we can do, we can cut off the middleman. That, that's quite easy. And that's what you outline also very nicely in, in, in your book. We could just get rid of the middleman. However, there remains one problem is we can get off the, uh, the middleman, but usually the middleman had a function and you don't get rid of that function. So what you always have to think about, if you get rid of the middleman, the function still stays there. And you can make a decision if you have a buyer and a seller and a middleman in between there, you cut off the middleman, either the buyer or the seller has to take over the function. And that, of course, could be quite costly because the consumer might have to search much longer if I don't have a platform such as Booking, it's much more cumbersome to find the right hotel to do all the comparison. So that would mean we have higher search costs. Or traditionally, the retailer had a function uh, as taking care of the logistics. So, I mean, the, the producer was easy. They shipped a huge package to the retailer and then the retailer split it up into many, many, many different packages. So that's one thing. If you want to get rid of the middleman, we, 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 we can't forget the function. And then we have, of course, additional functionality that the middleman can take also over. For example, it could serve as a mechanism to price differentiate. And that's unfortunately something that I, that I quite often recognize when I try to go direct. So for example, I search on the booking for a hotel, I figure out a price, I go to the website, and all of a sudden I realize they actually charge a higher price than the one for the middleman. What's the economic reason behind doing that? Well, it might be a short-term view, but it could be that the hotels are arguing, okay, we have some customers, they might be very loyal, they might be convinced this is the best hotel to go for, so we can charge them actually a higher price than those guys coming from whatever kind of platform. And by going to the platform, they kind of signal me, obviously I'm, I'm in tough competition with everyone else on the platform. So we can price differentiate for the one who's coming from the platform, we offer a better price because they might signal we are much more price sensitive than those loyal customers who come directly to the website. I don't want to say this is a good strategy because it might be a short term view and it might exploit too much the loyal customers, but that's unfortunately something that I realized uh, when going direct that actually I could get a much better price. The second thing I would like to highlight is that also the middleman can uh, serve as a brand shield. And as you know, uh, Priceline was fairly famous in the US and they had a very simple uh, business model. They wanted to sell uh, hotel rooms. And what they offered you, you could uh, type in where you wanna stay in New York. You could uh, signal the area you wanna stay in and then they, told you, okay, we have several hotels there and they just categorized them essentially by saying, this is a three-star hotel, this is a four-star hotel, this is a five-star hotel. And then you could bid for how much you're willing to pay for a night. So they had two innovations. The one was the pricing, but let's get rid of the pricing. That's not too much of interest. You could think about, they offer you a four-star hotel at a fairly low price, let's say 120 euros or 20 euros. And you could then say, okay, I, I do the booking, but you didn't know exactly which hotel this is. And the advantage that uh, Priceline offered is that it allowed a, a, a reputable hotel brand to also sell at two different prices. The one via revealing the brand and they wanna have a prestigious brand, which would mean, okay, we need to have a high price. But I mean, if they had, a, a, if they had too much capacity, and I mean, given the variable cost of a hotel are fairly low, they wanted to sell at a low price because that would still give them a margin, but they wanted to have a brand shield. They wanted to make sure we don't hurt our brand. And that's of course an opportunity to step in as a middleman. And quite ironically, Priceline was getting funded for this kind of business model. And then they were in the hotel or in the, in the travel industry. Actually, they bought the booking.com platform. And nowadays the price line model is no longer famous, but the booking. But so in that, in that sense, what I wanted to highlight, there are unfortunately also many very good economic reasons for having the middleman. 
So while having a lot of private sympathy for what you claim, I'm afraid we have a long way to go until we cut out all the middlemen. And it's also not entirely clear whether that's actually the, the, the best way to go for it. If we look at some uh, direct to consumer models where you try to sell directly, it turns out, for example, Caspar, the one selling the matrices directly, they had a huge acquisition cost eating up about 80 cents of a dollar. So that was simply an honest, unsustainable business model. And they could also benefit from having platforms that lower the acquisition costs. So that's a bit the, the economic perspective. I'm sorry that some of the slides didn't show up, but hopefully I could still illustrate my point. Thank you so much.